Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming this evening. I'm Sarah Softness. I'm the former. Oh. <laughs> I'm the former assistant curator of special projects here at the Brooklyn Museum and the fortunate collaborator for the last six months or so with David Levine on his fascinating new exhibition, Some of the People All of the Time, which opens, as you know, tomorrow to the public and to you all this evening downstairs um, just after the lecture in a moment. So I want to take a moment first to thank our amazing partners at the Onassis Cultural Center in New York. Um, with whom we are co-presenting this exhibition as part of their Birds, a festival inspired by Aristophanes, which has over the last weeks presented a wide-ranging roster of dynamic programs and performances all over the city. And it's been a really wonderful and fruitful collaboration and we are tremendously grateful to them and a, a special debt of gratitude to Violaine Huismont, a festival curator, and Boo Froibel, our festival producer for their vision. Um, seamless execution, generosity of spirit all throughout, truly, truly special. Um, next, I must shout out the tireless Brooklyn Museum team who's made this project possible. Um, Adrian Cotin, Sharon Matt Atkins, Emily Annis, Joachim Hackel, Elaine Kamarowski, Madeline O'Hare, just to name a few. Um, of course, all happens under the visionary leadership of Anne Pasternak, thank you, Anne. And finally, to the brilliant David, whose commitment and acuity and creativity have been continually inspiring and which I'm so excited for all of you to share in tonight. Um, so I'm gonna quickly say a, f a few words about the project itself and then I'd love to invite Violaine up on stage. And so some of the people all of the time takes up a deeply relevant and an anxiety provoking set of questions regarding democratic participation and political good faith, which ask us to consider who is being fooled in the public or political sphere and by whom? In a news cycle dominated by accusations of crisis acting, revelations by Cambridge Analytica, and crowd casting agencies, we must ask who really takes part in assembled groups, both in real life and online? And are they there for the right reasons? What even are the right reasons? In David's show, this suspicion and ethical fragility come together with a thread of celebrated practices of infiltration within contemporary performance art. The exhibition centerpiece is the live performance of a monologue enacted by a rotating cast of professional actors. Two distinct installations composed of artwork both from the Brooklyn Museum's collection, some on view for the first time in decades, and striking new prints by David form the stage set where it all happens. So with that, I'm gonna pass it now to Violaine, who will speak about two additional public programs we have, among other things. So thank you so much for coming and enjoy. Good evening. Um, this is the last installment in our festival, and it's a really great privilege to be able to introduce David Levine, who's an artist I've admired for many years. And so it was a great thrill to be able to co-present this work with, uh, with Brooklyn Museum. Um, our festival started about a month ago at the American Museum of Natural History to give you an idea of the range of institutions that we've partnered with over the last month. And the centerpiece of our festival was a production of The Birds, a new adaptation by Nikos Karathanos, which uh, was, we presented at St. Anne's Warehouse to a, for two weeks. Um, it ended last week to a sold out run. We were really thrilled to see this great new work of group theater presented there. The play originally was written by Aristophanes and premiered 2,500 years ago. And we based our festival on the play and on the themes that surround the play. So not only birds and in all of their interpretations, both metaphorical and uh, natural, but also in the sense of democracy um, and the uh, utopia and some of the some of the political themes that are addressed in the play and when we presented the project of our festival to Anne Pasternak she immediately thought of David Levine because it seemed to her clear that David's project spoke directly about this question that we've been wrestling with for the past 2,500 years, the question of how as citizens work together 
to create a fair and just political system. And not only that, but the question of how cultural institutions address that question in bringing together an audience and letting people experience work together feels very relevant. I think it's very unusual for an institution of this scale to present a project of this size and ambition in so little time. This is a world premiere, this is a new commission, and it all happened within the last six months. So really, I want to thank and acknowledge the extraordinary vision of Anne Pasternak for bringing this project and uh, David Levine for his incredible talent in putting it together. Um, as this is the last installment in our festival, I'd like to acknowledge some of my colleagues at the Onassis Cultural Center, also Karen Brooks Hopkins, my former boss at BAM, <laughs> thank you Karen, Amalia Kosmetatu, the executive director of the Onassis Cultural Center New York, so Sophia Eftimiatu, Mandy Boaku, Eleanor Goldhar, Zoe Dolan, Tamar McKay, who is also um, a member of the curatorial team here, uh, and many others. Thank you so much for all your great work and your support. There are going to be a few more public programs as part of this installation. On June 16th, there's a family event all day. And then on June 23rd, there's going to be an école de la claque. For those of you that want to learn how to be a fake crowd and how to boo and clap and um, encourage the performers. And on June 30th, David is going to moderate a panel discussion about the issues in the work that he's going to present. And now, please join me in welcoming David Levine. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank Sarah for everything she did for this exhibition. And you have to, you have to, you have to sit through a few more thank yous, but they're really, since they're really, really, really sincere. Um, I want to thank Sarah for everything she did for the show, Violaine for that great introduction uh, from the Brooklyn Museum. I want to thank, this is a non-exclusive thank you list, but uh, Anne Pasternak and Jennifer Chi and Sharon Matt Atkins and the entire staff who did a huge amount of work in a very short amount of time. Uh, and from Onassis especially, uh, Violaine and Boo Frabel and Amalia Kosmatatu. Uh, for everything they've done to bring this all to fruition. I also really, really, really need to thank the indispensable Ashley K. Tata, who is the associate director of this piece, uh, without whom literally none of this could have happened. And lastly, I want to thank the Rational Dress Society for this amazing jumpsuit, uh, the significance of which will become clear if you check out the performances after the talk. So, okay, I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about some of the ideas behind this project, but first I need to give you a little bit of history. Uh, June 16th, 2015, Donald Trump announced his campaign for president in the atrium of Trump Tower, surrounded by ardent fans from New York, from Connecticut, young, old, black, white, brown, men, women, they all have one thing in common, other than their love of Donald Trump. That's Domenico Del Giaco, uh, an actor known for The Streets, Right to Live, and Brooklyn Betrayal. And this here on the left is Courtney Klotz, a actress and model with the Made Worldwide Agency. And those two, along with every other person in the t-shirt, were brought to uh, Trump Tower for the campaign by a company called Extra Mile Casting that mainly does casting for background extras in movies. Cut ahead to January 20th, 2017, 2017 one of the weirdest weekends for fake crowds and crowd accusations ever. Um, a dispute breaks out over the size of Donald Trump's inauguration crowd, which seems smaller than Barack Obama's. The next day, the Women's March draws over 450,000 people, but right-wing media suggests that many of these supporters were fake, paid up to $2,500 each by the Soros Foundation. Meanwhile, in Langley, Donald Trump addresses the CIA. There is nobody that feels stronger about the intelligence community and the CIA. And then Donald Trump. The rapturous applause. In the meantime, 
right-wing media found proof that protesters at the inauguration were paid by a crowdcasting company, a left-wing crowdcasting company called Demand Protest. We assemble movements. Now, the left feared that this was a right-wing hoax designed to discredit protesters, but it turned out to be a left-wing hoax designed to discredit right-wing journalists. You should, actually, you should actually Google this one, Dom Talipso's performances. Um, okay, so clearly there's fake crowds and there's accusations of fake crowds and the accusation of, fake crowd, of a fake crowd has been around as long as the concept of a real crowd. As soon as acclamation became a measure of power or influence or commitment, Opposing forces found it necessary to delegitimize that commitment, usually by reference to incentive, as in they're only there because they're getting paid, or coercion, as in they're only clapping because they have to. Witness, for instance, the Emperor Nero's Augustiani, an elite corps of 5,000 soldiers dragooned into cheering on his musical performances. Nero is said to be the first person to fake a crowd, but we know this mainly through Suetonius and Tacitus, two virulently anti-Nero historians who had their own incentives to question the sincerity of his support. Now, sometimes a fake crowd is verifiably fake. The claque in 19th century Paris was a well-documented mafia of professional clappers, professional laughers, professional criers who could make or break a theatrical production. They would extort payoffs from producers, writers, and actors separately, sometimes all four, as in this domier itching of a man who's been hired by the heroine to cry, by the comic actor to laugh, and by the writer to stomp his feet, and by the theater's patroness to clap. This guy's gonna have a long night. The clack lived on in the 20th century as <laughs> laughter. His laughter is infectious, or so the theory goes. And in the 21st century, it, it evolved into the actual crowd rental agencies. There's Rent-A-Crowd in the UK. There's Crowds for Rent in the Southwest. There's Circus. A br uh, an app that tries to disintermediate party promotion with, by luring millennials with the prospect of free drinks. <laughs> and there is the aforementioned Crowds on Demand, your home for protests, rally rallies, advocacy, audiences, PR stunts, and political events. These agencies, as they promise, provide crowds for everything. There's party activities with a campy edge, self-promotion experience because life doesn't get any better than having a large crowd of people chanting your name, <laughs> exclaiming the world what a great person you are. There's more persuasive promotional activities, creating buzz, all these strategies bolstered the designer's image, leading to substantial coverage in TMZ, a doubling of his Twitter following, most importantly, a lucrative deal with the department store chain. And there's actual political organizing, campaigning, and picketing. Crowds on Demand was in the news just a couple weeks ago. And of course, there's just creating value. For instance, for art. You could request a crowd for an artist's exhibition to admire certain works. Yeah, you laugh, but crowds matter to art institutions, to nonprofits. Attendance numbers, translate into visibility, funding, and patronage from the blockbuster exhibition to the blockbuster protest. Crowds matter for press coverage, from photo ops to followers and reposts. And as we know, these two can be faked. Followers can be bought from companies like Davumi. Or they can be bought by artists like Constant Dillard, whose 100,000 followers for everyone project distributed 2.5 million Instagram followers among a personal selection of art world Instagram accounts. And the art version, I think, really crystallizes the paradoxes behind all this. Whether as protesters, ralliers, or spectators, the destabilizing thing about fake crowds is that they're not there for the right reasons. We know this. But what does being there for the right reasons even mean? 
and why does it matter so much? And what would the right reasons be? Is disinterested participation even possible? If so, what would it look like? If so, is it even desirable? I think fake crowds are actually a real problem. Entergy's use of crowds on demand for the New Orleans City Council meeting actually kept concerned citizens from being seated because they filled the auditorium, from being heard and from offering objections, thereby making it look to the City Council as though Entergy's plan enjoyed overwhelming support. Fake crowds actually helped that plant get approved. I also think that the accusation of fake crowds is a real problem. Accusing school shooting survivors of being crisis actors or dismissing catastrophes as false flag operations is not only pernicious, but socially corrosive. But it's also hard to say how prevalent a problem the fake crowd is, just as it's hard to say how effective foreign influence campaigns on social media were on the last election. So I think for tonight, the problem of the fake crowd is best considered from the point of view of why we find the idea so viscerally offensive in the first place. And the answers can actually be kind of odd. And before I speculate irresponsibly on that, I want to offer two caveats. One, in its current instantiation, the fake crowd is a uniquely American problem. Not because we're the only country that has fake crowds, far from it, but because as friends of mine from Russia, Egypt, and Latin America never tire of pointing out, Americans are the only ones who freak out about it. <laughs> People from Eastern Europe, for example, look at American anxiety over this as yet another example of our astonishing innocence. Whatever happens to us, we're always the first one it happened to, while other countries kind of take this stuff in stride. Uh, here's Julia Yaffe, a Russia correspondent for The Atlantic. And I remember at the first really big protest, right near the Kremlin, walking around and I see this young man wearing a scarf with um, gold, uh, yellow, black, and white, which are the kind of nationalist colors uh, of Russia, which seemed out of place there. I started talking to him and I asked him, you know, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, well, my, he, he was probably like 18, 19. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I'm here because my, my friends are here. They all wanted to come and participate. And at the time, the Russian state TV was already saying that Hillary Clinton, because uh, Putin said that Hillary Clinton had given kind of the signal for these protesters to come out, and state TV had taken this message and run with it and said all these protesters were paid for by the State Department, which if you have ever encountered the State Department and its <laughs> budget and budgetary woes, you would realize it's comical, but the same way we think Russia is omnipotent, Russians think the State Department is omnipotent and well-funded. So I said, well, you know your friends. Do you think they were paid by the State Department to be here? And he said, well, they deny it, but I'm sure they are. And yeah. I said, why do you think that? And he's like, well, I'm paid to be here by NASHI, which is the <laughs> pro-Kremlin youth organization. So they must be paid too. They're not just gonna come out and spend their free time for free. Another way of saying this is that we, well, is that Americans freak out about this because we place such faith in the meaning of the crowd to begin with. And this leads me to caveat number two. It's really weird that we place any faith in the crowd at all, because for most of the 19th and 20th century, the crowd was something to be feared. First as something unruly, volatile, and mob-like, and then, as John Plotz has argued, as something deadening and conformist. So think of all the sociological studies from the 50s and 60s of like one-dimensional man and the organization man and the man in the gray flannel suit. But in either the chaotic or the conformist formulations, the threat of the crowd was always that your individuality would get swallowed up, obliterated in the leveling wave of the mass. But today, our anxiety seems to be that there are people in the crowd who won't lose their individuality people who haven't surrendered their autonomy, or to be more precise, people who've already surrendered their autonomy, but to a force outside the crowd, a force whose purposes, unlike the crowd, are not clear. In this view, the fake crowd is akin to a 501c4 or other organization, a seemingly grassroots, spontaneous movement that has in fact been organized and paid for, AstroTurf, as, as Lloyd Benson christened it in 1985. And often, 
What we call a fake crowd is simply a group of true believers who've been organized by nonprofits that we don't like. So is it a fake crowd if the people are really cheering but someone else paid their bus fare? I don't know. Is it fake if you all write Amazon reviews for your best friend's debut novel? So what I'm trying to say is just that in discussing the fake crowd, we're traveling along an entire spectrum of belief, organization, and incentive. We equate authenticity with spontaneity, but as Lenin and countless organizers since have pointed out, spontaneity alone isn't gonna get you very far. And just because a campaign was organized doesn't mean it's not sincere. However, there's always the question of accountability. Those Amazon reviews are only effective to the extent that they seem disinterested. And 501c4s don't need to disclose their funding sources. This is the dark money problem. And fake crowd agencies are frequently subcontractors to middlemen, public affairs consultants who have themselves been hired by the real client who prefers to remain unknown. Entergy, for instance, hired a company called Hawthorne. They were the ones who contracted crowds on demand. Trump contracted a public affairs company who themselves retained extra miles, so there's plenty of deniability. Now, crowds on demand, all oh right, I just said that because I'm robotically reading from my own teleprompter. Um, Entergy was shocked and appalled to find out that paid actors had been hired to occupy the city council meeting because they would never do that because it goes against their core values. Now, the founder of Crowds on Demand, Adam Swart, he actually doesn't see what the big fuss is about at all. One truly bizarre afternoon in West Hollywood over the biggest smoothie I'd ever seen, he explained his philosophy to me. Say you've got 10 people who want to protest something. 10 people who are willing to protest for free. In Adam Swart's view, these 10 people are equivalent to one person willing to pay for a protest. Why is that? Well, this is because each of these protesters is giving up, say, $10 an hour they could be making at work in order to protest. In total, they're giving up $100. But this guy over here, he's willing to spend $100 in order to buy the services of 10 actors for $10 a piece. In both cases, $100 are being expended, so it's $100 worth of commitment either way. Who cares if it comes from one person or from 10? So if you accept money as the universal equivalent, all other considerations go out the window. Proportionality, for one. As the broader principle of one person, one vote for another. As Amway heiress and dark money impresario Betsy DeVos wrote, my family is the biggest contributor of soft money to the RNC. We expect a return on our investment. But even looked at from Swart's point of view, it's actually inaccurate to say that our protesters are losing money because they're investing time in future outcomes that could yield disproportionate economic returns. What is $10 compared to tens of thousands of dollars saved under universal health care, if you get it? As Stephen Squibb said, quickly, I think I heard him right, uh, a protester could be said to enter into a credit relationship with the future. You're investing your labor time now in exchange for a future return on investment. One reading of Marx suggests that debt and credit hold society together through mutual obligation. So along this reading, what's offensive about a fake crowd is that they're getting paid off immediately. Rather than investing in the future, they're just taking the money and running. And money as means of payment is inherently antisocial. But even then, the suggestion that you could see any incentive at all to aesthetic or political participation, even a future incentive, still seems grotesque, scandalous in poor taste. Compensation or incentive of any kind seems to discredit the purity of the crowd's expression. And that suggests that more than anything, the fake crowd is an offense against meaning. For 
from this point of view, what's offensive about the fake crowd isn't that it's too fake, it's that it's too real. Here we all are, trying to build a symbolic expression of blame or appreciation, trying to participate in and uphold the symbolic order, and there you are earning a buck. For all that we equate low-wage labor with authenticity, we're actually still pretty sniffy about actually earning anything. There's probably a lot more to say about clacks, about crowds, about art, and about work, but I think that's probably enough for the moment. Uh, I and the Brooklyn Museum and the Onassis Cultural Center would like to invite you downstairs to watch the preview performances in the Blum Gallery and attend the reception in the lobby. Um, thank you all for coming and have a great evening. Thank you.